Hello, my name is Guy Wallace, and in this PAC video short, we're going to overview the PAC processes and the EPI methodologies, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement, the HPT or HPI version of my methodologies. PAC is an acronym, performance-based, accelerated, customer and stakeholder driven, training and development of any blend. The PAC process methodology set is a subset of a greater methodology set, EPI, the Enterprise Process Performance Improvement Methodologies. EPI is the equivalent of Human Performance Technology or Human Performance Improvement or simply Performance Improvement or Quality Improvement or whatever your name and language is for those kinds of methods. What I attempted to do with the PAC processes is that when I designed it, I wanted it to be easily extended into non-training interventions, performance-based interventions, performance improvement interventions. As the PAC processes is all about performance improvement of incumbents and new hires through formal training and development and informal training and development where appropriate. The extension of the analyst role is critical to look beyond the enabling knowledge and skills for performance requirements and to look at those other variables, other variables that the humans bring and other variables that are necessary in the environment and in the environmental supports. The big picture of EPI first looks at the process and looks to ensure that the process is indeed designed to meet all of the stakeholder requirements for both the process itself and the products that the process produces. If that is the case and the processes are indeed designed to meet those stakeholder requirements yet is not, one would then look at the human asset enablers and the environmental asset enablers. The question has come up to me several times in the past as to which should go first. Well, I'm typically starting off looking at instructional projects and so I start off with looking at the human assets and looking at the first awareness, knowledge, and skill requirements and then capturing gap data that attribute, is attributed back to physical attributes, psychological attributes, intellectual attributes, and personal values that the human brings to the process. However, there is a case to be made for starting with the environmental assets, as most of the data from people like uh, the late Deming and the late Gary Rumler would identify that either 80 or 85 or 94 percent of performance problems or opportunities are management controlled and in the environment and not what the human is not due to human failings. So you could look at the data and information requirements, the material supplies, the tools and equipment, the facilities and the grounds, the budget and the headcount, and the culture and the consequence systems that are in place in the environment and their impact on the ability to bring a paper process to life and meet all of the stakeholder requirements. Stakeholders vary from performance context to performance context. In my example stakeholder hierarchy here, you'll see that the government sits on the top. Some might make the case that society, or what Roger Kaufman calls mega, should really truly sit at the top. If that's the case, then change this example to fit your reality. But I have the government sitting at the top because the laws and regulations and codes of all of the lands that your processes operate in must meet those government requirements, even if that's contrary to what the shareholders and owners want. The government wins all ties and has the power of fining the organization or putting people in jail for violations of their laws, regulations, and codes. Second in the hierarchy here in this example are the shareholders and owners. You would not meet the customer's requirements and or their desires if it was contrary to the requirements and desires of the owners. The customers in this model lead the definition of the requirements to be met, but they do not sit at the top of the hierarchy. 
Each hierarchy of stakeholders is again unique to a performance context and one must give thought to this. This is where the measures for both the products produced and the processes used originate. On the right hand side of this graphic here shows the division of the human asset management systems and the environmental asset management systems that help enable the process performance. This also needs to be customized to the performance context. The HR type systems at the top of that model aren't always named thusly. You'll need to find out how that is configured in your organization and find out who is responsible for organization and job design and redesign. Who's responsible for staffing and succession planning? Who's responsible for receiving? Who's responsible for recruiting and selection systems and training and development and performance appraisal and performance management and compensation and benefits and recognition and rewards? and rewards and recognition. Is it the client themselves in the processes or is it the responsibility of a human resources type organization or is it a shared responsibility or is it simply unclear and undefined? The environmental asset management portion of this graphic, the model on the right, the information and data systems Information and data can come from many, many sources. When one looks at a particular process or set of processes, one needs to decide, one needs to determine where does the information and data come from that feeds that process, that that process also feeds. What are those systems? Where are they? Who owns them? Are they adequate to the needs? Who owns the material and supply systems that enable the process? What are the tool and equipment systems that enable the process? What are the financial systems that enable the process? The facilities and grounds that enable the process? The culture and the consequence systems that enable or inhibit the process? This is the role of the analyst to determine where are these systems, what are they named, where is the responsibility? Is it unique to one of these owners of these enabling systems? It is a shared responsibility with the process owners? Or is it totally unclear and therein lies the problem or the root of the problem? Enterprise process performance improvement involves two stages. The first stage, targeting EPI. In targeting EPI, process maps and performance models are used to identify what is the ideal performance required and what is the current state performance and where are the gaps and what are the causes of those gaps. After that is clarified, one again looks to the process or bundles of processes or an entire value stream to derive systematically the human asset requirements and those environmental asset requirements. In a targeting EPI effort, the current state analysis identifies the current state and in phase three the future state is designed and in phase four an implementation plan is put together based on the requirements for moving from the current state to that future state. A targeting EPI effort leads to EPI intervention initiatives. In this graphic we show a six-phase model for getting to that future state. I hope that this video short and the series have been helpful to you in helping you to establish a practice of performance-based training and development, learning and knowledge management. 
I have been conducting, writing, and presenting on these methods since the early 1980s. My recent book, Six Pack, covers all of this in much greater detail.